Hi there. Uh, today we're going to test these vintage pastels. They are by Prima Marketing and uh, they're sold by Art Philosophy. They're very affordable. The palette is pretty decent if you like to paint with your uh, with the, with paints in your hands. So you can use these for plein air. Here's a sample of the colors that these come in. Um, I'm not sure about the pigment information in these. I've had this set for a while, but um, I'm going to re-swatch them today. They're really kind of pretty. Um, I don't really know. Like I said, I don't know what the pigment information is, but they're, they're not too chalky. Um, they'd be great for crafters. They say they're professional quality, but I have not done a light test on them. Um, but I would think they would be wonderful for cards and crafters and that sort of thing. So what I thought we would do is paint a bunny together. Um, let's re-swatch these first. So I will get that set up and uh, you can join me in the swatching process. Alrighty, we're ready to swatch. I've got a uh, Princeton Neptune number no. 8 brush. I love these for watercolor. They've, uh, they're a faux... Uh, I want to say faux squirrel, but I'm not certain if that's correct. Um, at any rate, they are not uh, genuine uh, animal hair products. So if you are concerned about vegan materials, this one is great. And it's a beautiful paintbrush to have. Um, I've never had a problem with them. They hold a great point. And I'll let you get up close there so you can see the point a little bit. And when it's wet, it's when it really comes to a sharp point. And I've got my, uh, my swatch all laid out. As you can see, the colors are not... Uh, traditional watercolor names, so uh, like periwinkle, sage, golden glow. We're gonna have to see what they look like. So when I swatch, I like to have um, some inexpensive paper. That uh, this is actually wood pulp, and it's uh, I got a three pack on Amazon for. Oh gosh, I don't even remember. I'll put a link in there. But this is great for taking with you. It does have a heavy texture to it, but the other side of it is fairly smooth. So if you wanted to, you could um, work on either side or both. I also have some water over here off camera that you can't see and a paper towel to blot my brush with. So, all right, let's try. We'll just get the paper wet first where we're gonna swatch. This is how I like to swatch. I'll put the, the water down <clears throat> in the square that I wanna work in. And I, I have that little black triangle there so that you can see how transparent this, uh, this paint is. So we're gonna use the periwinkle first. Let's see, that's this one here. And I haven't sprayed these paints at all. So I just wanted you to see what they're like if you just put a couple of dabs of water on there and use it straight out of the pan. So here we go, here's the periwinkle. It's very light, very sheer indeed. Let me see if I need to spray these paints after all. I might have to. Uh, you can see that they are somewhat opaque. I'm not seeing a lot of granulation, but that may change as we go on. Let's try the next one. Here comes Sage. We have, I live in Colorado and all of our Russian Sage that is so popular in uh, a lot of people's yards. Oops, forgot to get this wet first. Uh, it's in bloom now. And every year I think, oh, I've got to get some of that and put it in my yard because it looks so pretty. It's kind of like a big tumbleweed <laughs> that blooms a beautiful purple haze on the top. And um, it's one of my favorite plants, but I don't have any in my yard, but there's plenty where I walk. So that is, I do get to enjoy it that way. Okay, here's the sage. Again, you can see it's very, sh very sheer um, in hue. It's not sheer in opacity. It is somewhat opaque, just like the periwinkle. Okay, here comes the Golden Glow. This one I can't remember. This one might be iridescent. And iridescent paints are fun for a little bit of an accent. This one might just be more of a pastel, kind of a yellow ochre-y uh, uh, kind of a paint. Let's see if it's got any sparkle to it. Well, you know what? I cannot tell. We'll have to wait until we get our bunny going and then, I, then I'll be able to see. Okay, what's next? Terracotta. I got a little bit of that yellow on my brush there, but that's okay. I don't think it'll really jeopardize this swatch here. We'll get a good juicy amount on here. Oh, I like this one a lot. This is a good color. 
sometimes these specialty palettes are, um, <laughs> I kind of have a love-hate relationship with them because sometimes I think, well, oh gosh, I love those colors, but then I think, well, what am I going to paint with them? And as you paint more and more, I think you will realize that value is really what matters, not necessarily the color. And I know there's a lot of artists out there that will do things in a monotone, a monochrome, rather, or uh, rainbow colors. And of course, the, the dogs are so popular, you know that there are no rainbow colored dogs in reality, but it makes for a great piece of artwork on your wall or on a greeting card. So those uh, rainbow colors, you know, every color has its own uh, temperature. And as long as you get the shadows right and the highlights correct, your painting is going to look wonderful no matter what color you use. There's also color relativity where if you will have, oh, that suede is kind of nice. That's a great color for beach sand. I like that a lot. See already, I'm seeing all kinds of, see if these were cottages on the beach and this was the sand, that would be very lovely. Um, at any rate, color, uh, what was I saying? Color harmony, I believe. Uh, when colors are next to one another, now to be honest, I'm not sure I'm using the phrase color harmony correct, but color relativity, I think, is that what I said? <laughs> I'm sorry. At any rate, what I'm trying to say is when you put colors next to one another, your brain will read them as something whatever if if you've done the shading correct the correctly the your brain will read it not necessarily according to what that color appears on its own but in relation to other colors okay the stone gray is lovely it's kind of a taupey gray with looks to me like there's a lot of pink undertones in that i don't know if the camera can pick that up but that is a lovely color here it looks more like an elephant through the through my phone but also that'd be another great color for an elephant if you like painting wildlife, which I do. Animals are my favorite thing to paint. What's your favorite thing to paint? Comment below and uh, let me know in the comments and we'll we'll have a discussion about what our favorite thing to paint is. I, I love animals, so this bunny is kind of a, that we're going to paint is kind of a no-brainer to me. Uh, let's see, where are we? We are on Breezy. That's a good name for paint color. You know, actually, these these color names remind me more of wall paints <laughs> than they do uh, watercolors for their names, but that's okay. These are fun to use. This one is kind of a combination between the Periwinkle and the Sage, actually. Um, now, I haven't rearranged this palette in color order. You could certainly do that. I just kept it in the way, in the order that it was in. I must have missed with my marker a little bit right there, that little dot. Um, I kept these in the order that they were in when I received this um, item in the mail. So I just, uh, and I did purchase this on my own. Um, the one, the reason I wanted to review it today is that I just don't use it very often. And I wanted to see if it was the paint or if it was me. <laughs> Sometimes you have uh, an art supply sitting there for a long time and you just don't go to it. It's not your favorite. And today I thought, well, you know what? I will see if I can see why. Oh my goodness, I love this color. Look at that lilac. Okay, people, I am kind of a sucker for purple, but that, I hope you can see how beautiful that is. It's just a gorgeous purple. It reminds me of, that's probably why I like purple, a little dress I had when I was a little girl uh, for Easter, my little Easter dress. Oh my gosh, that was just the best color. Okay, and again, there's that, between this, the lilac and the soft lilac and the sage, that would be the Russian sage that is so popular in our neighborhood that I was telling you about. All right, here comes charcoal. This is looks like a good dark black. I'm not seeing uh, too many undertones in this one. It looks pretty neutral. I'm not seeing any green leach through or reds, browns. It looks very neutral which tells me that this one might be a good one to mute or mix with other colors. If you ever uh, needed to change the value of a color, you could tone it down a bit by adding just a touch of black. All right, dark rose. Oh my gosh, this mauve tone. My husband and I were married in the late 80s and this mauve tone, dark rose, was the color Every wedding had to have this color in it. And guess what? 
Mine did too. <laughs> Ours, I should say. He was definitely a part of it and has been for all these years. <laughs> oh, that's very pretty. Oh, I like this for animal noses and ears. And I typically use Potter's Pink, but look at that. That's a really nice shade. That would be great for, like I said, ears and noses, little kitten paws. Oh, that'd be so cute. Um, these all tend to have that kind of a, um, I don't want to say milky or chalky, but let's just say they're not, they're not transparent. I would say they are semi-opaque or semi-transparent. Let's go with semi-transparent because they're not that opaque. I don't know, is that kind of like partly cloudy? Does that mean it's mostly sunny or does it mean that, that there's more clouds than there is sun? I never know that. <laughs> Apple Blossom. Oh, this is a cheerful little pink. That reminds me of something that you would paint a uh, baby's girl's bedroom. That's very sweet. I like that. And then finally, we have our Dusky Mauve, which again, looks like a very popular 80s color. Let's see how it comes out on the palette. Maybe that's why I'm drawn to these, uh, this palette so much is because these are the colors that were popular when I was starting out my life as a wife and mother. Oh, that's kind of a nice color. It's, it's, uh, it's barely purple, barely pink. It's, um, gosh, that's almost just like a pure taupe. Dusky Mauve, they call it. Okay, so these are the swatches. And I will go through and see if I can lift them and I'll do a glaze and then we'll see what uh, what we think, what we can do with these. All right, stay tuned. And we're back. I've done some lifting on all of them except for one because I wanna show you how I lift. I would say that they all lift somewhat. That golden glow is really hard to tell, um, but it's such a sheer color anyway, a pale color. But these all will lift a little bit. That suede almost looks like it has some granulating properties, as does the stone gray. That's very nice. And yeah, they all lift pretty well. I left the, I'm in love with that dark rose. I left the last one that we can do together. This is the charcoal. I wanted to show you how I'm lifting. I have a wet brush here. And you can see the sheen on there that, that that's pretty wet. And now I'm gonna take it off just a little and then I'm just going to one, two, three, and dry my brush. One, two, three, dry it again. One, two, three. Now, I'm, there is no rule on how to make your swatches or how to try and lift paint. Um, on this particular paper, I was just trying to be a little more gentle than I would if I had a scrubber brush, which usually the bristles are a bit heavier. Um, the charcoal is looks like it's a bit staining. It did not lift as much as the other one. Same as the dark rose. That one kind of stained a little too, as did the lilac. But overall, I think it's a beautiful palette. And I think it will make a wonderful little bunny for a card. So I will go uh, get my card supplies and we'll draw a little bunny. And we are back. The uh, kinds of cards I like to use um, are these Strathmore greeting cards or watercolor greeting cards. They are blank when you get them and they are pre-scored. Um, they come with a matching envelope. Uh, they're kind of an ivory color, off-white. And this is just what I have left out of the pack. But you can see they're, they're pre-scored, so they're very easy to fold. And I've already drawn the bunny on here for us. So there we go. That's the little guy we're going to paint today. And it's a little smudgy, but that's okay. All of this will work out in the end. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and paint, tape him down here so that we can have something to work on without worrying about uh, going off the edge. I like to have a nice border when I make a card. It just gives uh, gives it a nice little, little frame on your picture. So we're going to go pretty shallow on this. As you can see, I did not give myself much room on this little bun bun. Here we go. We're going to have a very thin uh, border around this probably gosh about an eighth of an inch so now I'm trying to just eyeball this we'll see how I do when we're, when it's all said and done that feels straight um, that one's not not straight I can see that boy that's the thing if you get something off 
when you're trying to line something up, your eye just goes right to it. So it is easier to have a wider border. Well, we'll see how that does. It's only a card, right? And that's one thing, uh, one other thing I wanted to talk about too. Whenever you're creating anything, don't sell yourself short. Don't compare yourself to other artists. There are literally millions of artists in the world and let alone here on YouTube. Everyone has a different style. Everyone has different methods, different talents. Whatever you make is the best because you made it. And if you go into your art with that kind of an attitude, I think that that's a good place for your mind to be. And that's a great way to start thinking about when you create. In the picture that I have, and I'll try and put a link to it in the description, the bunny's sitting on some kind of a rock. And the rock is uh, pretty typical of the, the type of rocks we have here in Colorado. It looks like a granite. I'm sure that they are just about everywhere in the US, let alone many parts of the world. But what I'm doing is I'm wetting the paper first just with clean water. I did go and get some clean water after my swatching. And now I'm gonna use some rock colors. I'm gonna go in with this terracotta first. And watercolor, we always work light to dark. So I'm just kind of gonna blob some colors in here and we'll see what we can come up with with a little bit of shading. Now, when the, you'll see the picture, the light is kind of coming from this direction, but it's a little bit backlit. So I've got a little bit of freedom and I'm not looking for anything super realistic here. We're just making our own illustration of Mr. Hopper. <laughs> Should we call him Hopper? That's a little like Stranger Things. I kind of like Mr. Bun Bun. So I've got some yellow in here. Uh, let's, let's look at some of this gray. That'll be good to pick up with the, the bunny's fur too for now and then just a touch of the charcoal for some of the darker shadows in the rock just kind of making some marks here because what I want to do let's go and put a little bit more terracotta these can all blend together and then what I want to do is I want to show you a trick with a piece of a credit card or a gift card, or in this case, I'm gonna use a palette. You can scrape designs into wet work to make it look like a rock. So what that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna scrape right there and up here maybe. Oh, I'm scraping a little deep there. Whoops, get a little zealous. There we go, a little bit there. And I'm just blotting it on my towel in between scrapes. This will give us some hard edges that are quite common in this uh, this variety of rock. And it will kind of lend us to some more interesting uh, texture when we're done with our painting. Okay, now I'm gonna let that dry. And meanwhile, I will go ahead and, you know what, It's because everything I see, I was gonna go ahead and paint up here, but then I see this is gonna touch the rock. I think what I'm gonna do now is go ahead and get my heat tool and dry this and if that's a little bit noisy, I apologize. This is, a, this is the quieter one that I have. This is by Ranger, Heat It Craft Tool. I like it. It's amazing how much heat it can generate. Yeah, that's gonna be dry enough for what we're doing. Now I know it doesn't look like rocks yet. This is the other thing about watercolor. It goes through an ugly stage, in fact, it might go through several ugly stages. Um, don't be hard on yourself. Just let it happen. It's just the nature of the beast. And you're going to be working on a painting and think, oh my gosh, I have no talent. This is horrible. I hate this. Just keep going. It just means you're not done yet. Another real good bit of advice I like to give is walk away. <laughs> when you're starting to feel frustrated by a painting or if it's just not doing what you want it to do, just walk away. Leave for, uh, go for a walk, go have a snack, drink a glass of water. That's that's my, my big thing. You're probably dehydrated. Go drink a glass of water <laughs> and then look at it with fresh eyes. Um, but yeah, that it does make a big difference. 
Now we're just going to make a big su uh, suggestion here of some sky and uh, flowers in the background, that kind of thing. So we're just going to do a, a melange of pastels. And the reason that walking away really helps when you're creating is that it gives your brain a chance to rest. When you're creating, you're using your creative thought processes very intensely and sometimes it's just too much and you can kind of go into overload a little bit and then your brain just can't see it. So if you walk away, give it a little bit of time, then you'll be able to see things more clearly when you come back. Right, isn't that what mom always said? Moms are right. Okay, so there's kind of just a suggestion of grass and sky. We're just gonna keep this really simple. And now I'm gonna put some purple in there. Maybe there's some flowers growing over here. Rabbits love thistle. We know that from Thumper. He was my favorite Bambi character. Let's see, we'll put some pink in there too, just to add some color variation. There we go. And again, this is wet and wet for this part of it. Now what I'd like to do is get this gold going. I think what I wanna do is get some gold and splatter it a little bit. Now this isn't, like I said, it's not an iridescent gold, it's just a yellow, like a yellow ochre. So what I'm doing is getting an awful lot of paint on my brush. I'm really loading it up. And you can certainly make a puddle. That's easier probably. I'm just fixated on using the pans and that's certainly not necessary. And you're gonna get as much paint as you can and I'm covering the rabbit so that I don't splash on him. But yeah, I'm gonna to need to water that down a little bit more. There we go. And I'm tapping it. You can also do something like this. And you can see where it tapped out some of that yellow. I need to get more paint on there in order for that to really work. Um, that's the other beauty of watercolor is when you are working while the paint is wet, you can always typically blot it up if you make a mistake. Now normally I would cover the back of this to protect it. And I certainly could do that to the rabbit too. But right now I'm kind of just playing. We'll clean up the bunny here in just a minute because he really got splattered. Okay, let's just try this. We'll do some on the rock too for some more texture. All right, so now since I haven't painted anything the bunny, I'm just touching my paper towel to the water and we'll just blot that up. There. All right, time to dry again. Now watercolor always dries lighter than what you've put down. So remember that, that if you're looking for a darker tone, you will have to go back in and put on another coat. In watercolor, another huge bit of advice I can give you is less is more. Now you see all these, these splatters that are still on our bunny? Don't worry about it. It will end up being just fine. And I used washi tape here, and you can see as you use a heat tool, that does make the washi tape come up. But that's all right, it's just loosening the adhesive, which is also how I'm going to remove this washi tape without tearing paper. Um, oh, look at that, I got some black on there. That was not intended. Let me try to, I've got a little bit of yellow mixed with that blue on there, and that is certainly giving me some green. So now we're going to have to make lemons out of some lemonade here. That will be a suggestion of some kind of a tree or something. There. All right, we'll see how that looks later. Okay, now, since we are gonna go light to dark on this rabbit, this little rabbit's a little gray guy, but he has the cutest little pink spot on his nose. So I'm gonna use that apple blossom. And I'm gonna put that on his little nose right here because that's just too cute. And I'm also going to use some in his ears. This is where I'm taking a little bit of artistic license with the bunny because I don't think his ears are really pink. I mean, you know, this is a very, very illustrative rabbit. None of them have taupe fur. 
like I was talking earlier when we were making the swatches about um, doing your your values a certain way so that no matter what your colors are, your your animal will still look, or whatever it is you're painting, will still look and feel the right way. Now, I am putting that dusky mauve in areas where I want the rabbit to be lighter. And now I'm going to go in with the stone gray and just kind of blend that a little bit. So see, I'm leaving a little space there. So that gives that dusty mauve highlight chance to show through. And we'll just kind of dance around here a little bit. I put some on his feet. This part is wet on dry. I didn't make an effort to do any wet on wet for this part of the rabbit. That gray got a little dark there. I'm just adding some water to it here so that I can spread out that pigment. But that gives me a great idea. So now I can add some shadows. I've got a thicker texture of paint and I'm going in and just giving some darker points to our little guy here. Okay, and I know that I mentioned earlier the um, the light coming from this direction and I do have it darker on this side. So now I know that I need to go over here and make this a little bit more pronounced. When you're painting, darker areas will recede and cooler areas will come forward. So we're going to do a light wash of this gray on his face. Kind of get into that pink there. Go around his eye. I don't want to touch the eye yet. I will, but just not yet. And why did I said that I went over his other eye? There we go. There. All right, little Bun Bun, how you looking here? Let's go and do your ears, shall we? So I'm gonna paint this ear. I'm putting all of the pigment along that back line, and then I'll go in with a wet brush and just pull that forward. A little bit at a time. I'm gonna pull it in and get that to look a little soft right there. I'm going to put just a little bit coming up from the rabbit itself. And I want to go back to that taupe and put some on the top of his head because the light would be shining up there a little bit. And now we'll go to this ear for the stone gray and we'll make that fine line again. I've got very little water with this paint. It's very thick. It's almost uh, the consistency of watercolor out of a tube right now, this particular one. And then I'm going to get my brush wet and just kind of let that paint flow. That's another, it's funny, it's a, a misnomer uh, about watercolor. Oh, the paints have such good flow. These are such good flow. You know what? That makes it fun. It really does. It makes it a very fun painting, but it has nothing to do with the quality of paints. It has to do with how much um, uh, ox gall that they put in the paint. Some paints flow a lot more. I know Cor, Q-O-R, is a brand that flows quite a bit. It's all in what your style is and what you would really like to achieve while you're painting. Now, okay, you can see that he looks kind of like a hot mess right now, but that is okay because now we're going to go in with some details. And I'm going to see how much I can get done with this brush before I need to change. And I think I need to change brushes right now. <laughs> Let's see here. I just want a smaller brush. Uh, here we go. This is another Princeton Neptune. It is a four. It's a brand new brush. So I've got to get the sizing out of it here. I used up my silver black velvet four and it started to fray so much oops, that I had to get a, a new one and I decided to invest in these uh, Princeton Neptunes this time 
every every brush is an investment. Um, <laughs> we, if you're just starting out, I would recommend the Princeton line, the Snap brushes. That's S N A P, like you snap your fingers. The brushes do have a good snap back to them. They're uh, they're very responsive, and they will uh, be a really good way for you to start your watercolor journey. All right, and you can see what I'm doing here is just kind of filling in his little feet, but not filling this in like a coloring book. I'm leaving some space. Let's see if I can show you. Yes, see I'm splaying the bristles out. And then it has this, this uh, fanned out edge a bit here. I've got too much water on that. Let's try it again. There we go. So that you can do little hair on your furry critter. And we'll do a little bit more over here on this foot. The hairs that are coming down and then some hairs going up. Rabbit's feet. Did anyone have a rabbit's foot when they were a kid? I We used to get those all the time. And actually they're kind of creepy now, but uh, boy, I thought they were so neat. I would sit and feel the bones in the foot. Is that just weird? <laughs> it's certainly not. Uh, I mean, you would think that the rabbit served some purpose before he donated his foot. I don't know. Things were different when I was a kid. Um, but yeah, that's uh, rabbit's feet. Little bony things. Kind of an odd thing to talk about when you're watercoloring. <laughs> Okay, and we can leave these white spaces too. I'll do more of that in a, uh, another painting that I have planned for us uh, later, but leaving these white spaces are how we achieve highlights in watercolor. Now what I am doing, since these, are, these paints are a little different, they're just a little bit opaque, I am going over where it has dried, and it does dry quickly, with a oh, thin wash of this dusty mauve. That will allow me to uh, spread that pink highlight catching the warmth of the light from the, on this side over here where we wanted that bunny to have a little more warmth. Okay, now we're gonna go into the stone gray again and we're gonna increase these shadows under here. And it come out like this to kind of make it so we can see his fur. Fill that in a bit. I'm gonna add some dusty mauve to that little section right there. I think, in front of his legs. And then under here, we'll just kind of feather that up in. All right, yeah, I like that. I lost my hair around there, but after it dries, I can go in and fill that back. And let's get our shadow in here. Yeah, I'm gonna have to wait for that to dry. Oh, no, I don't have to wait for anything. I'll use my heat tool and we can get that to dry right away. I just want to get a shadow in there. You can see how adding that shadow here really made that his little left paw come forward. We're going to try and do that with his other paws. Come on, bunny bun. Make your paws come forward here, mister. The paint is a little too wet. There we go. All right, let's see if we can get this shadow. Now, if I wanted to darken these shadows, I could go in with just a touch of the charcoal, which I think I might. That is a very strong black. You don't need, you don't need hardly any to get that to, uh, to darken. Let's see, we'll elongate that one. I'll add some more darkness in here. And I will be back in just a minute. Okay, so one thing I've noticed is kind of interesting with this painting. Do you see this area up here where I had the little smudge? That kind of looks nice. I like how that tree uh, or plant, bush, whatever it is. Can you see the color separation in there? I'll zoom in when we're all done with him, but it really, uh, really ended up looking nice. And this looks like a, a good spring day. And this is kind of looking a little more like a rock, although I haven't done a thing to it. Let me see if we can work on his little 
feet here a little bit. We'll just do some very fine little lines to get the fur. We don't want him to look like a porcupine, but we do want him to look a little bit fuzzy. Yeah, I kind of, I love bunnies. Thumper was my favorite. In college, I had a rabbit. Oh my gosh, that poor rabbit. I named him Ted Goldfarb. <laughs> and he was a lop-eared rabbit. Didn't work out. Ended up surrendering him to the uh, Dumb Friends League where I had picked him up and uh, thought it would be, you know, love forever. But, oh, Ted and I just weren't meant to be. So, yeah, it wasn't for me. But, boy, how many of you have stories like that of family pets that turned out to be not a success? I, you know, we've I've had a lot of pets all my life. But some of them have been challenging. I'm just kind of blotting this up. That didn't do what I wanted it to do. I was trying to create a shadow under his chin. Um, but most of the pets we've had, honestly, have, have just been wonderful companions. I have, I always call her my studio buddy, my uh, Sheba. Her name is Sasha. She is a senior. She's 14 years old. And I don't even know if you'll ever get to meet her, to be honest. She used to come down here and be with me all the time. But now she's just kind of a napper. And she's at that point in her life where we need to take her outside very often um, because she just, I don't know, just like every other grandma I've known that uh, you just need to use the facility a little more frequently. Okay, let's do this little guy's eyes. They're so sweet. You know, eyes are interesting because you can do them right away or you can wait and do them at the end. Sometimes, ooh, he looks angry now. <laughs> Sometimes when you do them at the beginning, it's great because you can establish a win right off and you kind of know how your values are going to be set. Um, oh, his feet look hilarious. I'm going to have to go fix that. <laughs> he looks like he stepped in burrs and brambles. Okay. Um, but when you're doing the eyes, like I said, you can start it at the beginning or at the end. I'm just adding a little bit of black fur marks around here very lightly with my brush. And then what I'm going to do is make sure that I leave a highlight. Now, um, I always like to do it too big at first, so that's why I'm working outside in. And then I just fill it in to wear it there. That looks pretty good. I've got a little highlight there, just a space of white that I did not paint. And we're going to do the same thing to the other side. Now this eye is kind of a little bit off to the side. And... I cannot remember on the reference photo right now if there's a highlight there, but I'm going to put one in because otherwise it would just look like a black socket of some sort on his eye. Well, I sure like his face and I like the way he's kind of washed out here. Uh, not in that he's, uh, that you can't see the colors, not that kind of washed out, but I like how he looks suede. He looks like suede. Um, let's do this. I'm trying to get a shadow under his little chin here. There we go. All right, we'll mix some black in with it. We'll just go under it like this, and maybe under this little jowl here, too. And then I'll get that wet and pull that down. That ought to be a good little shadow for our guy. If I can do it without moving the paint that was already there. The uh, These pigments are pretty cooperative. I, I think for a craft paint, these will bring a lot of joy to a lot of people. Um, kids could use them. Let's give you some pink on your cheeks here, buddy. Yeah, kids could use them. Students, um, professionals, people far more talented than I am. <laughs> I, I paint for fun. I do enjoy it. I, I would like to think that I have some talent, but I have given up on that pursuit. I think what is really important is how it calms my mind, how it, I feel like I have contributed to uh, my soul in a way, if that makes sense. Um, I think that art is very, very therapeutic. And I think that that's, it's very healthy to focus on something that just makes you feel good. Okay, he looks a little angry. Let's fix this jowl over here. 
we don't want him to be grumpy old man bunny. I'm mixing a little bit of black in with that uh, stone gray just so I can have a dark, dark line. He's got some folds in his skin. Maybe if I add those in, it'll, it'll help a little. So you can see my style is very illust illustrative. Illustrative. It is not realism. I don't claim to have the patience for that at all. I am greatly in awe of artists that can achieve realism. I would love to be able to, but it's just not who I am. Um, oh, I'm liking his face. That's just really too cute. Let's give him a little a bit of a uh, line there for his eye. Let's see here. Um, okay, those feet. I really don't like those feet. I'm just taking a wet brush and let's see if we can just lift some of that off. And we can kind of... There. Now I'm going to come back in with the heat tool here for just one second. You know what's kind of fun about this rabbit? He could be one of those garden statues. He could be made of stone. Uh, right now his feet look horrible, but... <laughs> Like I said, there's always a bad stage, a, a help me out stage of your drawing, and I think we're right there with mine right now. Okay, let's see here. Let's get some more of this suede color. Not suede, I'm sorry. Stone gray. You know what I'm going to do first? I'm going to take this taupe. I'm calling it taupe, but it is the dusky moth. And I am going to put a little bit of that on all of the tops of his feet because that is where the highlight is on his feet. And then I'm just kind of going to feather that up into his fur, leaving the bulk of it down there. And that is going to give us a nice look to his little feet. See, already that looks better. Now, I'll go back in here with the, whoops, that's not thick enough, with the stone color. Okay, now I'm going to dry that. Oh, I did make him look a little grumpy. Might have to fix his face fix his little smile. I don't want to give too much detail on his ears because to me the focal point on any animal is their eyes. Um, I really like the way his eyes came out and in order to be successful to make animal eyes the only tip I can give you really is don't do it near anything wet and use a very small brush. It's just the best thing you can do is to um, just try and have that steady hand. Let's try and blend this a little. I'm just using clear water. There we go. Now we've got some bunny feet. And I'm not crazy about that shagginess down here that I did. Whoops, excuse me. So I'm gonna go back to my number eight round and I'm kind of flattening it out. Can you see that? I'm squeezing it so that it's flat. And I'm just kind of smudging that a little. Yeah, I'm not, not a fan of the way that came out. I am being using a very light hand. And now I'll go in with this gray that we had here mixed up for the rabbit and get some of that yellow. And kind of go over this rock. That's kind of a good color mixed together. Uh, when you are working in your watercolor, it's a good idea to use colors in more than one place. So what I want to do is take some of this taupe that I've used to highlight the rabbit up there. It's very subtle, but it will show up in the rock here. Okay, now I'm gonna take some water and wash that up. See then that just gives you that much more balance. I hope you can see that. Okay, I'm gonna do just a little touch up on his little face here. Just a tiny, tiny little swirl of the 
paint here and get that closer to his little mouth. All right, I may have lost the original intent of my light source, but I sure like this guy. Um, he definitely has a somewhat 3D look, which is just what you're going for. And you just look over your painting for different uh, light and shadows and try to replicate that in the values of your paint. I'm going to mess off his ears here and get some more of pink in there because that's just too cute. And then he'll be done. There, we did that without any problems of any kind. No back runs, no, uh, no issues whatsoever. A back run, um, oh gosh, one day I'll do a video that shows you all of, all of the watercolor problems that you can have. <laughs> there are a few. Okay, well there's our little bunny. Let's get the tape off of him. And like I told you, I like to use the heat tool to do that. So let me turn that on here. What this does is it, it heats up the adhesive that's on the paint, uh, excuse me, on the tape. And then you do not tear the paper because it doesn't give it a, that extra stick. And the other thing that I do is I try and tear it off at a 45 degree angle. Ooh, look at that nice white frame that's coming out. Good job, little bun. Oh, there we go. Okay, he is all finished. I think I really like the way that he came out. Let me pull him up close so you guys can see. There's some of those splatters we had. And you see all that rough texture. I mean, none of it is perfect, but that sure is a sweet little rabbit. There's some of that color separation in that bush that I was talking about. It's so pretty. And this, you know, this represents flowers off back in the background. He's just sitting here on his little rock, having a good old day, waiting for some strawberries. <laughs> Alrighty, well, I'm going to sign my name to this. I'm very happy with the way that it came out. And here we go, Nona. It's not my name. I am Nona. I, am a, I have two grandchildren right now, and they do call me Nona. And I'm very happy to be Nona, so I do like signing my art Nona sometimes. And this is one that a child would really appreciate, I think. So this one does get the Nona <laughs> signature. And this is July of 22. There we go. So this is a 5 by 7 card ready to mail. And I hope you had a good time. And I hope you learned, uh, learned something new. And if you'd like to tag me on Instagram, I would love to see your rabbit. Thank you so much. You guys, everybody have a good day. Well, it looks like I'm back for a little while. I realized that when I finished painting the bunny that we did together, I forgot to go back and glaze these. And I wanted to show you some of the process of glazing. Um, oh, great, I've already done that one. <laughs> uh, let's go to this here. This is the suede. I'm just going back and forth three or four times. Make sure I get enough pigment on there. You can see that on some of these, particularly the golden glow, that's beautiful with a, a glaze coat over it. Now this stone gray, and I, I know this one's gonna be nice because we just used him on our little bunny. And that layered so well with that glaze over it. Now let's try the breezy. I just love that color breezy. I like that for a wall color too. Hmm. But here's my favorite, the soft lilac. Oh, I love that color. And this charcoal, this is a good black. I, you hardly need any of it to make, boy, that look at that, that's almost opaque. You hardly need any of it to uh, tone down a color, make a, a darker hue. Let's see, this is the dark rose now that I'm gonna glaze over here. Oh, that's quite lovely. I like that apple blossom. I used that on the bunny too, that was a good little color. Oh, that's such a nice baby pink. And finally, the dusky mauve. So there you have it. Let's go ahead and dry those a little bit and you can we can see how they handle the glaze. Boy, as soon as I'm done with the last one, the first one's already dry. But the, uh, the periwinkle did pretty well. And the sage, I love the golden glow. That glazed so nicely. 
Um, actually, I don't have a problem with the way any of them glaze. They're all quite lovely. But look at that stone gray. That's, wow. I mean, I think that might be my favorite color. You can see where I did the lift underneath and these glazes, it's still showing through. So they do have some transparency. So definitely, I would call these semi-transparent paints. Um, I think they're a great paint to start with. Um, the only thing I would caution against if you are beginner, beginner, is this might be a weird palette to start with. You might wanna get a primary palette, a more traditional set. To be honest with you, if you are just starting watercolors, I would go down the back to school aisle. Right now is a great time because they're having all the sales and pick up a child set of watercolors. I started out on a Prang set, which is your basic school supply set. The colors are bright, they're vibrant. I know Crayola makes kid sets too. Um, no harm in doing that. You can just make a very small investment and see if you even like it. Don't use the brush that comes with it. Go ahead and get yourself a good brush. And like I said, I recommend the Princeton Snap for beginners. Um, but then again, these I'm using the, the Neptune, which if you wanted to start off with a little nicer brush, you sure could. Their Neptune line is also pretty affordable as watercolor brushes go. But at any rate, there you go. There's the end of the swatches. And now I will tell you bye-bye, have a good day, and we'll see you next time.